Bethany Malosh. As you see, she was, uh, as I mentioned previously, sh she and Josh just married at the end of June. Bethany is the CMTA's director of social media. She takes care of so much at the CMTA, including our new website, www.cmtausa.org. So if you have any problems with the website, you can also email Bethany. <laughs> but she does all our Facebook um, and has really created a very strong social media platform for the CMTA to bring everyone together, communicating on Facebook and with each other, and we've created some great groups and communities. So with a warm round of applause, I'd like to introduce you to Bethany Malosh. Thank you, Elizabeth. I wanted to lead off with this picture uh, because for one, it's a great excuse to show off my wedding photos. Um, but also, if you have CMT, you know that it comes with a lot of peaks and a lot of valleys. And I wanted to start on a peak today, uh, which is in June, I got to marry my favorite person in the world, uh, who's also my, my tech assistant today. And my wedding is one of the wonderful things that has come out of moving forward despite CMT and the very real challenges of CMT. But because I have CMT, my forward movement isn't always exactly graceful. And so I have titled this talk, Tumbling Forward. I've come up with some rules over the years to help me always keep moving forward. And I'm gonna share just a few of them with you today. Really, I didn't create these rules as much as I tumbled into them. They're also my rules, and while I realize that yours will be different, I think if you have CMT, you'll find some of mine extra helpful because we tend to share a lot of similarities, particularly in how we view the world. For example, if you don't have CMT and you look at this picture, you might go like, oh, that's, that's sweet, that's nice. But if you do have CMT and you look at this picture, you probably notice things that other people don't. And you're more likely to be thinking, She's not seriously walking on grass, is she? Yeah, bad decisions. And once I add some details to this equation, like the fact that both my dad and I have CMT, you can probably even guess what our internal dialogue was like in that moment. Don't fall. Don't fall. Look up and smile. Don't fall. Please don't end up on YouTube. And did I mention that we had wedding crashers? Our wedding grounds and ceremony site had been infiltrated by a devious little enemy that looked something like this. <laughs> Not so cute. <laughs> so the dialogue was more like, small steps, don't fall, go for hole. <sighs> Getting to the front was a very emotional moment for my dad and I. First, because we were incredibly relieved that we had made it to the front. But it was emotional for a lot of reasons. One being that there was a time not long before that we wouldn't have imagined I would ever be walking down the aisle. Not because I wasn't marriage material, mind you, but because I wouldn't have been able to walk the distance. By age 18, I could not walk without pain and needed a wheelchair. This is my grandma and little me. I grew up watching grandma put on her leg braces, but I didn't ever think much of it. I just thought that it was something grandmas do. <laughs> grandma and I were very close, and even though she's no longer alive, a little part of her will always live on in me, in the form of a duplicated gene on chromosome 17, <laughs> giving my father and then me CMT1A. By age 14, I would have leg braces just like grandma. And in school, as my abilities decreased, I found myself turning down invitations from my classmates to their houses or to parties because I was so scared that I might encounter stairs and that my classmates would then see how different from them I was becoming. A few events from this time really stand out to me now. In high school, I went to see a Shakespearean play with my class, and the theater was in this incredible building which had floor-to-ceiling windows all the way around. 
As my classmates and I walked toward the building, I could see our reflections and the reflections of other people passing by. But one reflection really stood out to me. An old woman who was walking up the hill toward the building, hunched over, she tottered along, taking slow, careful steps. And I watched the woman out of the corner of my eye until I approached the building, and suddenly we were eye to eye. And she looked at me, confused. The old woman was me. I had been looking at my own reflection the whole time. CMT had changed me so much and so fast, and it wasn't until that moment that the undeniable reality of CMT's effects on me sunk in. I didn't recognize myself. The old woman was me, and I was only 14. School field trips are full of potential pitfalls when you have CMT. We saw the play, Julius Caesar, pretended to like it, and then it was time to go. And the theater looked something like this. Yeah, I know, I was thinking the same thing. If you have CMT, you know that stairs plus a crowd of people is just asking for trouble. And we were at one of the bottom rows and they wanted us to exit at top. They called each school out of the theater one at a time. So I had to leave with my group. And as my school gets called, I enter the aisle to go up. And after just a few rows, my legs are having none of it. And they refuse to go up any more stairs. Luckily, one of my teachers saw my desperation. She maneuvers through to me. She's literally pulling me up each stair. And behind me, I can hear teenage boys from another school shouting, move, move. I was mortified. And though with some help I did get up those stairs, I cried myself to sleep that night. This may be a good time to call out a rule for tumbling forward. Tumbling forward rule number one, teenage boys can wait. <laughs> Thank you. If you had asked me back then what I thought I learned that day, it would have been something like, don't go to the theater. Now I think about it a little bit differently. I felt bad in that theater. I felt ashamed. And I often feel this need to apologize for myself and for my CMT. And even that I shouldn't go to things like plays because I might be an inconvenience. We don't need to apologize for CMT or for our limbs moving a little bit slower. We need to move at our own pace. And it's not always going to be the pace that others are used to moving. But you know what? Americans are in too much of a hurry anyway. And it's OK if someone has to wait a few extra seconds so that I, too, can enjoy a play or a movie. I also appreciate how frequently, when people do see me moving slowly, they actually stop and wait to hold open a door. Speaking of doors, I suppose when you have CMT, you often develop a large set of rules simply surrounding doors. This is Washtenaw Community College. I started taking classes there when I turned 15, and it was a great experience overall, except for the doors. Now first you have to know that I was really excited about going to community college because I saw it as a chance to reinvent myself. Nobody there would know that I had CMT, and I could be a new me, a Bethany without CMT. There was only one small flaw, which is that I do have CMT. So that fantasy lasted about a week until I found myself on the ground in front of this beautiful building here, having been taken down by a handicapped door that was moving a little bit faster than I was. Here's the culprit right there. So I'm on the ground, bruised, a little bit embarrassed, and with a new door nemesis. But I told myself, hey, at least nobody saw it happen. Well, before that thought had even fully formed, I look up into the face of a campus police officer who is shouting loudly into his walkie-talkie, we have a girl down, a girl down. I need backup, backup. <laughs> Seriously. And within five minutes, backup Ashley did arrive 
two more security guards speeding up in their little vehicle golf carts, lights flashing, clearly nothing better to do on a Sunday, and declaring that they had been dispatched and the situation is now under control and the girl is back on her feet and doing okay. Very loudly, just in case anyone on campus hadn't yet heard. Yeah, this was just another one of those days. Tumbling forward, rule number two, don't trust handicapped doors. And I think this one speaks for itself. I've always dreamed big. At age five, my dream was to be a princess. Uh, but by age 18, I had downgraded that to a neuroscientist, which is a big letdown, I, I know. And I found an amazing college that basically promised that if you could get there through their pre-med program, they would get you into medical school. So I went to this beautiful, magical place in the fall of 2009 in the snowy hills of Pennsylvania. I decided that CMT may knock me down, but I wasn't going to let it hinder my path. Did I mention that it was in the snowy hills of Pennsylvania? <laughs> yeah, if that sounds like a bad idea, then you're a lot smarter than I was at 18. I progressed really rapidly that first year at Juniata College. I now needed a scooter or a wheelchair to get just about anywhere, and the steps that I did were painful, and I would be left with just bleeding calluses at the end of the day, so I'd have to decide between being able to get to the cafeteria for dinner or being able to go to class the next morning. After a grueling winter in Pennsylvania, it was finally summer, and I went back home to Michigan. But summer break when you have CMT doesn't necessarily mean you know, fun in the sun. It means, great, I get to go back to working with my physical therapist. Now, for any physical therapist in the room, despite the joke, I have a ton of love for physical therapists, and I was actually really lucky to have found a fantastic physical therapist in Michigan who I was actually excited to get home to for the summer. And I basically told her, I need you to turn the ship around and get me back to where I was, because this is just not working for me. It's not. And I was shocked when at the end of my first appointment, my always very conservative physical therapist said, Bethany, it's time to see a surgeon. You're not going to get the results that you want from physical therapy. I did take her, or her advice, and I went to see a surgeon. And then I went to see another surgeon looking for a different answer. But they both told me the same thing. They said that I would need 20 plus procedures over the course of two surgeries for me to be able to walk again and to walk without pain. And the second surgeon said some especially concerning things, such as, first, I'm going to break your big toe, which is a terrible way to start a conversation. <laughs> the words oscillating saw <laughs> were thrown around once or twice. Yeah. But the worst thing that he said, the worst thing, was take time off from school and do this now. And remember, this couldn't happen because I had decided that CMT was not and could not change my life plan. But the more I thought about it, I knew he was right. When every step hurts due to your ankles turning and your feet being contorted, you're just tired. And I knew that I needed a change. And so I decided to take time off from school and do the surgeries now. For any of you who have been through surgery, you know that recovery is very long and it's very hard. For me, it was all worth it the moment that the surgeon unwrapped the foot for the first time. And it was the most beautiful foot I'd ever seen. And don't get me, don't get me wrong, it was like a really ugly foot, okay? <laughs> and I lovingly refer to it as my little Franken foot. But it was straight and it had the promise that I'd be able to walk on it again. And so to me, it, it was beautiful. And these are just the before and after photos. This is after my left foot had been operated on. And you can see just the incredible visual difference uh, before and after surgery. I learned an important lesson through this experience, which is that sometimes I do need to be willing 
to change my path and to forge a new one. I had thought that it was really noble to deny my CMT and to pretend like it was never going to impact my life. And I've come to look at this a little bit differently. I accept that I have CMT, or rather I accept myself with CMT, because don't get me wrong, we still have a love-hate relationship, just about the love. But I have to remember that I do have CMT, and sometimes it is going to impact my life, but it's not ever going to become who I am. And sometimes your new path ends up being better than the one you had originally envisioned. I never did go back to Juniata College. Snowy mountains were just not in my new future. Instead, I moved to sunny California where I was promised no snow, and so far it's held up to that. So we're buds. I transferred schools again, this time to UC Berkeley, and with a new major in nutritional science and metabolism. I was forging a new, equally bright path. My first summer at Berkeley, I took a writing class, like Writing 101, and there were only seven of us in the class. When about halfway through the semester, our teacher gives us the assignment to write about something that scares us, to write about something that truly terrifies us. So I take this home, and I'm sitting in front of my keyboard thinking about what to write about. I could write about fear of heights. I mean, everyone's afraid of heights, yeah, right? Yeah. But I know the thing that really terrifies me. And as soon as I write my paper, I'm filled with immediate regret and dread, and I don't know how I'm possibly going to turn this into my professor. What is she going to think of me after she reads this? And I go to sleep that night just thinking about how I'm going to hand it in and, and what the rest of the semester is going to be like. But hey, at least it's almost over in a few more weeks, and then I never have to see this woman again. The next morning, I come into class, and I'm clutching my little paper. And the teacher says, today, for the first time, you are all going to be reading your papers aloud <laughs> in front of the class. Oh, no. This cannot be happening to me. This is my nightmare. And I'm looking for any sort of escape route. Meanwhile, the first student goes up. He reads his paper about his fear of heights. A second later, he's done. The next one goes up, heights again. I'm like, you should have gone with heights, clearly. <laughs> Suddenly, Bethany, it's your turn. And I will myself up to the front of the class. I'm shaking, holding this paper. I look out, and I feel like there's just a million little eyes on me in that moment. The thing that scares me, the thing that truly terrifies me, is something that I have to face every day. It's something that most of you don't think anything about. The thing that scares me is crossing the four lanes of terrifying traffic every morning from Oxford to Addison just to get to class. Because I have a neurological disease called CMT, and my nerves don't communicate correctly. And every time I step off that curb, I wonder if today is going to be the day where my left foot isn't talking right to my right, and I go down in the middle of the street. And I wonder, what are the pedestrians, what are the people in the cars thinking? And I know what they're thinking. They're thinking, why is she going so slowly? What's wrong with her? And every time, I wonder if today is going to be the day where I fall down in the middle of that street and I can't get back up. And there's silence. Finally, after what feels like several minutes, one of my classmates who is this bleach blonde jock here on a rowing scholarship, he's never talking to me before, he looks at me with tears in his eyes and he says, Bethany, we are all in awe of you. I faced a bigger fear that day than crossing the street. It was the fear of revealing myself and revealing myself to my peers 
but by being willing to stand in that fear and to feel it, I was able to move through it. And I was able to connect with people in a more powerful way than I ever had with my peers. In high school, I was so nervous that my classmates would judge me that instead I didn't give them a chance to know me. Don't hide away like I did and miss those opportunities. Give other people a chance to know you and to see how awesome you are. So I told you I was getting a nutrition degree at this point. So I'm in this pizza place. And I had just finished a really grueling nutritional science exam. So I figured, what the heck, I'm going to reward myself with the biggest, sloppiest, largest piece of pizza known to man, which is at this place in Berkeley. And I'm a few minutes, a few mouthfuls into this ridiculous monstrosity when I notice an older homeless woman walk into the storefront. And I guess I don't know that she's homeless, but she was wearing several layers of tattered and mismatched clothes. And she comes right up to me and she asks, how much is that? She's, she's looking at this ridiculous pizza hanging out of the side of my mouth. And I tell her, $1.75. She goes straight to the table next to mine and she starts dumping the contents of her purse onto it. And coins are just clattering all around. Some of them are rolling onto the floor. And she's going through each coin and holding it up to her face and inspecting it. There's a man sitting next to her eating his own ridiculous monstrosity. And she asks him, shoving this coin into his face, can I pay with this? He puts his pizza down begrudgingly. He picks up the coin from her. He looks at it and he says, that's a peso. No, you can't pay with that. And as I'm watching this go down, I'm feeling increasingly guilty and awkward. And frankly, it's ruining my pizza experience just a little bit. I'm about to go offer her a slice when suddenly with a swoop of her arms, she dumps all of her coins, pesos, pennies, back into her bag and she walks out. And I wonder if I'm always going to regret not buying this woman a slice of pizza. I decide to chase after her, although I do have CMT, so not quite chase. But I slowly walk after her. And luckily, she was also moving at a slow speed, so I catch up to her pretty quickly. And I say, hey, I would like to buy you a slice of pizza. She looked surprised, but in broken English, she said, thank you. And I took her order, pepperoni, classic. And I turned to leave, but she grabs me by the arm and she insists on paying me. So I'm holding out my hand for her to drop her previous mess of pesos and pennies into. And you have to know that CMT has greatly weakened my hands. And often accept accepting change or small items is very difficult for me. So the moment that she drops the coins into my hand, each coin, one by one, slips through my fingers like sand. The coins clatter to the ground. And I'm standing there in front of this woman with empty hands. She looks at my hands, and then our eyes meet. And it's like we see each other for the first time. And she says, I'm sorry. She bends down, and the older woman picks up each coin off the floor one by one. When she stood, this time she cups her hand underneath mine so that the coins won't fall out before giving them to me. That was the most rewarding slice of pizza I ever bought because in that moment of connection, where we looked into each other's eyes, there had been a shift. And in that moment, the woman saw me, not only for someone who could buy her a slice of pizza, but someone who also had a private struggle. The helper became the one in need of help, and she showed me the same respect and compassion. We each saw each other for exactly who we are, human. And it's those shared vulnerabilities that are what makes us human. Only when you're actually willing to show your vulnerabilities and those cracks and those fissures are people actually able to see you 
and if you're so lucky to let you see them back. We are all tumbling forward, every one of us who are human, the abled, the disabled, the Berkeley science students with CMT, and homeless women looking for a slice of pizza. And just when we think we aren't tumbling forward, that's when we tumble. But it's those moments when we find ourselves on our knees with empty hands, those tumble moments that are what make us human and that challenge us to learn and to grow. These are some of my rules that have helped me to tumble forward through all the peaks and valleys of CMT and through life. And through it all, I have experienced some truly incredible peaks. I've graduated from the college of my dreams. I found a career and an organization that I love and am passionate about. And I've married someone wonderful. I will continue to find, some not on purpose, but I will continue to find new challenges I've been lucky to have had amazing results from surgery, and one thing I now do every year is to do a fundraiser walk for the CMTA. I know that CMT is progressive, and right now I walk because I can, and this hasn't always been the case. I walk for my grandma, I walk for my dad, I walk for myself, and I walk for all of you. Next Saturday, I will be walking 13.1 miles for the CMTA. If you would like to support me and my fundraising goal, or if you or any of your loved ones are in Michigan and want to walk or just eat food afterwards, you can visit this link and find out more about it. These are some of my rules, and admittedly, I don't always follow them, but I hope and I challenge you to find your own rules, because when you do, wonderful things can happen. Thank you.